Pan Pan Psychast. Part two: Further analysis and discussion. Oh, sorry, it's me, isn't it? <laughs> uh, William James noted how at one moment we can be aware of the noise, you know, like in our experience. So right now, I can hear a seagull on my roof, and now thinking about it, it's been squawking and walking around for the last five minutes, and it's almost as if someone's been listening the whole time. I wasn't aware of it a moment ago, and so you give an example. In your it, William James's isn't the seagull example. I think he gives one of um, like a, is it a clock. You give one of uh, walking up a hill, and you you look at your watch, and you, you, a few moments later you realise that you just looked at your watch and checked the time. But at the moment you weren't quite consciously aware of it. Do we have an explanation from psychology or philosophy for how we can seemingly not be aware of our conscious experience yet kind of undergoing it at the same time? Ah, well, you were wonderfully tripping yourself up there. Um, <laughs> I felt like I was. <laughs> I noticed first when you said not quite conscious. You're hedging your bets there. I, I suspect, I might be completely wrong, but I suspect that you're kind of imagining that thoughts have to be either conscious or not conscious. Yeah. Now that, I can tell from your, yeah, that you're kind of, yeah, okay, you think so. <laughs> <laughs> because this is one of the assumptions that people very often make. Mm. There, there are two linked assumptions here. One is a sort of more scientific one, that brain processes must be either conscious or not conscious, mm -hmm. and that we might find them. That re relates to what I was talking about earlier, about the neural, looking for the neural correlates of consciousness. That assumes that brain processes are either conscious or not. Mm -hmm. And some people are happy to give that up. I mean, Dennett, um, that one of the reasons I so loved Dennett's Consciousness Explained, which loads of people hate, and they say it's Consciousness Explained away, and blah, blah, blah. but he really showed how, how um, nonsensical that idea is. But linked to that, and more pertinent here, is the idea that thoughts or feelings or emotions or ideas, whatever, or perceptions, must be either conscious or not conscious. Mm -hmm. Now, you can see where this idea comes from. I am sitting here now, and if I ask myself, well, let me ask you, are you conscious now, Ollie? Uh, yeah, I'm conscious now, Sue. Uh, are you conscious now, Jack? Yes. Were you conscious just before I asked the question? Feels intuitively so. Mm -hmm. You're not absolutely sure. An interesting thing, and I got my students to do this when I used to teach okay. consciousness courses at university, I started giving them these exercises that I played with myself such a lot in the past, and it was fantastic what happened. So the first exercise I would give them, go away until next week's lecture, and as often as you can, preferably many, many times a day, ask yourself, am I conscious now? And what happens is what's just happened with you two, people say yes. And they nearly always say yes, and some very sophisticated thinkers say no, and then you get into interesting arguments, but mm -hmm. mostly people say yes. But then the second week, they'd come back and talk about it, and tell me how hard it was to remember and they didn't do it. And I'm saying, mm, it's not like writing an essay. You can do it when you're walking along the street. You can do it when you're cleaning your teeth. You can do it anytime. Why don't you do it? Mm. Mm, yeah, it's difficult thinking about consciousness. Yes, isn't it? Well, mm. get, get your act together, students. <laughs> Think about it every moment of the day. Am I conscious? <gasps> you know. Anyway, the next week would be, am I conscious now? Was I? What was I conscious of a moment ago? Mm -hmm. And that flips you. And I had quite a lot of students who would go that was so weird because I really didn't know we make there are there are two questions there one is were you conscious a moment ago and the other one is what were you conscious of you can use either and they have slightly different effects but the point that I'm trying to get at here is actually very important to the way I think about consciousness which might be completely mad which is Whenever we ask about consciousness or make ourselves think about it, which and, and, and mindfulness is one way of doing that, but that you know that's another story, but it, it's very similar. Whenever we do that, we kind of collect a whole lot of stuff together and go, oh, this is what I'm conscious of now. And the contents of my consciousness are these two screens in front of me and that um, house plant behind them and the lamp and that, you know. But that in itself is an exercise in doing something. And I suspect what's happening in the brain then is bringing together current perceptions with the self-model, the body schema, the self-schema, and so on, and going, oh, I, I, this mythical internal being um, who's in here, am conscious of that 
tree thing behind the screen. Were we doing that a moment before? Probably not, because we were not absolutely mindful or asking, am I conscious now at all? We were actually getting on with thinking about the question you're asking me and whatever it might be that we're doing. And this, to me, is a fundamental part of the illusion of consciousness. If I am right about this, then what's happening is something like this. The brain at any time, we know it's a massively parallel system. It is in parallel processing all kinds of different stuff. Mm -hmm. Perceptions, thoughts, ideas, fears, worries, you know, loads and loads and loads of different things. Only some of them are connected up with a self model. Mm -hmm. And even then, probably only partly and for certain purposes. It's only when we actually ask, what am I aware of now? What am I conscious of now? That we pull stuff together and go, it's obvious. And that brings us to the false idea that consciousness is a kind of container that has contents and leads us to this continuity illusion that I was always conscious all day. Because after all, I can remember coming in here at quarter to um, 10 and thinking, oh, he'll be sending that email in a minute. I better get on with it. I can remember all those things happening. Mm. If I asked the question, was I conscious of them at the time? I would say that is not an answer. It's not that I was, it's mm-hmm. not that I wasn't, that there is not a fact of the matter. It is not, there's not a truth about whether I was or I wasn't. Certain mm-hmm. thoughts were going on, certain actions were going on, but this particular organism here did not ask the question, am I conscious now, and give the answer yes, and erect an, you know, a whole story around it. So that is why... I was coming back to William James. He, he foresaw so much. He, he, he wouldn't mm. put it together in the way I do. And, oh, I'd love to have, you know, they ask you, who would you like to have to dinner from the past? Oh, I'd so like to ask him these things. <laughs> he said about the clock. Um, these are not an experience, a common experience, which still is in my room with a chiming clock, but for most people it isn't a common experience. I hear the clock is chiming and I think, oh, what time is it? And I can remember back. There are four strokes, and this was the fifth, and I'll go on counting. Oh, it's seven o'clock. Was I conscious of those before or not? Well, obviously, because I can remember them. Well, obviously not, because at the moment I became conscious of the clock, there'd already been four strikes. Mm -hmm. That's one example. The example that you um, talk about, about my, my climbing the hill, was after I'd been, I mean, this was only a couple of years ago, I was in Australia and I was climbing um, a sort of volcanic, was on an island off Sydney, and I was climbing um, a, a sort of volcanic track, and it had little steps in it, wooden steps that on the steepest bits, you know. It was very, very hot day, and I was trudging up here. My husband didn't want to come, and I was on my own, and I was thinking deeply about the nature of consciousness because I was in the process of writing while I was on this trip writing a, an article about it. Mm-hmm. And as I walked up there, I was aware that I had to get the boat back at a certain time. And at some point, I, I my foot was going, I can remember it so well now, I can remember the, the, the color of the dark um, earth and everything. And I lifted my foot and onto this step. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, am I going to be in time? And I remembered then that about a few steps back at the time, I could remember how many, I had actually put my arm up, looked at my watch, seen it was five to 12, and I'd Mm -hmm. hoped I'd get to the top by 12, and then that would be enough. And I was nearly there, and I thought it was fine. And I hadn't even realized that. It just came back, like like sometimes dreams suddenly pop pop back, you know? Mm -hmm. It's perfectly clear that, well, is it perfectly clear? Seems to me there was no answer to whether I was conscious of it or not at the time. Mm -hmm. I was conscious in the sense that I was a conscious being looking at my watch and able to think to myself about the timing of the trip. Mm -hmm. But I was not conscious in the sense that it had completely gone out of my mind. And I was about to look at my watch again when I remembered I'd just done it five steps before. So, you know, I think the answer is not, we must find out which. And the answer is certainly not in my opinion, and I might be wrong, that you could look inside the brain and get an answer. Many people would say, well, there must be an answer, so we must find in the brain what was different about when you were conscious of looking at at your watch and when you were not conscious of it. I say there is no difference. What you'll find in the brain are looking at watch things in the perceptual system and the arm moving bits and, you know, all of that, and there isn't an answer to whether you're conscious. We construct retrospectively those conclusions. So at that moment of seeing my foot there and I kind of stopped and went, oh, whoa, that's amazing. 
I retrospectively could have said, oh, well, I was conscious of that. Of course I was. Or I could have said, oh, I wasn't. Of course I was. But I didn't do either because I am practicing all the time in life, allowing it to be illusory and then not to be an answer. Mm. And that's why I ask my conscious now and go, yes, in which case I've given an answer. But it's only a momentary answer as a flash and gone. So I've I've done this myself before. I think I first came across you, your work soon in about 2011. I've picked up little bits and pieces in between now and then. And I remember being, I think, an undergraduate and uh, a seminar leader. You might know him, uh, Barry Dainton. We were reading your big consciousness introduction. He said after the first week, go away and just ask yourself, was I conscious then? And so do this. And every time we pick up consciousness books, you kind of yeah. engage in this uh, self-reflection it's as if you were trying to look inside the fridge and see if the light's always on and as you put in your book and there's a little picture of you in the book which i found quite amusing of you looking into the fridge <laughs> yes. um, and it's not like you can do that with the brain you can't drill a hole in and see like the cartesian theater you're experiencing these things and the examples you're using in your book i think i agree with you wholeheartedly that this is a bit of an illusion if not a complete illusion that i'm always conscious that there's this continual stream of consciousness yeah. and perhaps we do do it retrospectively but i want to push you on perhaps some of your other views because oh, i've just been to a... something there um yes certainly my yeah. great hero william james who coined the phrase the stream of experience mm. and i'm saying well that i mean sorry the stream of consciousness he actually mostly talked about the stream of thoughts but he's always, mm. it's always, I think he only once called it the, the stream of consciousness. And I think he wasn't really committed to a continuous stream because he kept asking these questions about, you know, the, the, the flights of the bird perchings and, and flights and so on, mm -hmm. and how um, unpredictable that, that stream is. Sorry, go on. No, that's fine. And I wonder, um, on the same point, clarifying James's view, I, I want to see perhaps what yours is here. Because I remember, you might not remember this, We, me and Ollie both met you uh, back in 2018 at How the Light Gets In Festival. They'd double booked, no offence to the organiser of the festival, but they double booked our venues and you were talking and we were supposed to be uh, interviewing, I think it was Ben St. Annie at the time. And so they, they one of the organisers stood at the back of the tent and said, Sue, do you mind wrapping up and you quite rightly politely said no <laughs> like why would I do that I'm halfway through my talk uh, and so we rushed on afterwards and we started setting up our equipment and you came over to me and uh, with a microphone on you thinking I was some kind of roadie because I was setting up microphones said yeah can you take this microphone off me I said I'm sorry sir. I, you know, I don't work here and you said go on what are you scared of <laughs> I was like, I'm not scared of anything and then I don't know what I meant <laughs> You're like, just, just pull it. Come on, what's wrong with you? And I was like, I'm really sorry. And someone uh, swooped in and saved us. But we uh, went to see your, your talk in, in, during that festival. With uh, uh, You were talking to Philip Goff, who's been on the show a couple of times. And you know, in that talk, you say you, you're a type of panpsychist. But elsewhere, you've got a chapter in this Journal of Consciousness Studies saying that, I think you, you say that Frank, uh, that Keith Frankish's illusionism might be the only research project uh, worth pursuing. So I wonder what your view is on this then. Like how, what, what, how, in what way is consciousness an illusion? Is what, in what way are we getting the debate completely wrong? Could you, could you clarify your position on this? Well, if I had an absolutely firm position, then probably I could. But um, mm. and the panpsychism is pretty tricky. And Philip Goff and I had long conversations after that, you know, formal debate that you're talking about. And we mm. went on and had dinner. Well, and dinner never arrived. That that conference was so chaotic. Um, we sat <laughs> yeah. an hour at the dinner table when no dinner arrived. So, but we had. I mean, I was having a brilliant discussion with Philip Goff about panpsychism, so I didn't mind, and we just went off and bought some food somewhere else. Um, but anyway, uh, that aside, we we should say that they've sponsored the show, and they're absolutely brilliant. The organization <laughs> is fantastic. Harry, what did you say? Oh, you should say they've sponsored the show before, so we will say that they're absolutely brilliant with organisation. <laughs> <I mean, laughs> a long time ago. Um, <laughs> you started it with that story about the, <laughs> the, the double booking of the room. Uh, anyway, yes, so sorry. Um, so the, there are two things that you've asked me about there. One is what I mean about the illusions and the other is about mm. panpsychism. What I mean about the illusion of consciousness is not that I have an answer to the problem, but that it seems to me that we keep getting lured into the hard problem, which doesn't get us anywhere, gets us into all the kinds of dead ends that I've talked about already. And the, the fundamental illusion 
uh, as the Buddha saw and other mystics and so on have seen, is the nature of self. If we think there is a self that has consciousness and free will, we are wrong. There is hmm. what? The self uh, is a construction of the brain. Uh, it's done, uh, a lot of it's done in the temporoparietal junctions and you know, there's all sorts of connections forward to decision-making areas and to um, episodic memory and all kinds of stuff going on. But it constructs an ongoing model of our body and what it's doing and what it's saying and all of that and has a, a longer lasting self image and it's not you know it's just a bunch of neurons doing stuff it's 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 a, a creation of the brain and mm. um then when we think about was i conscious now we've talked a lot about that just now and you you made some good points about that that's an illusion that we think that this self goes on and it's conscious all the time we think that there's a difference between conscious thoughts and unconscious thoughts and we're wrong in, in those and many other respects. If we take simple things to do with perception. I mean, as you may know, I did some, uh, well, I did one of the first ever experiment, I think, on, on um, uh, change blindness. And I was fascinated by that because people think that they would notice changes that we can then show that they don't notice. All mm. part of the, another kind of illusion that we think we have a continuously present uh, representation of the world when probably uh, we only have snippets of, uh, of the bits that we're currently attending to and then they lead to a story and uh, a, an illusion of, of of presence it's mm. an illusion in the sense that well there is a tree there I mean if we believe in an external world there is a tree there but I have the feeling that I'm seeing the whole tree at once when I'm looking at it. But in fact, if we see what's happening in the brain, you know, there's attention going to little bits here and there and so on. And out of that, we make a story and we put it into a kind of illusory sense of time and we build up a false idea of who we are and what we are, mm. which is wonderful to me that this is coming out in neuroscience and philosophy, as well as in mystical traditions. Um, and in, in particular in, in Zen, which has it sort of, to me, the, the, the clearest version of that. Um, so that's the illusion bit. But what about the panpsychism? Well, you know, this comes back to what we were talking about. Um, you asked me about evolution and the function mm -hmm. of consciousness. Now, if it isn't separate, and zombies, if, if zombies are not possible and consciousness didn't evolve for a function like other attributes we have, what the hell is it? Mm -hmm. Well, then, you know, then you're really stumped. I will not go the way of, um, you know, I do a lot on near-death experiences and I talk a lot. I did a podcast a few days ago um, uh, uh, about that with lots and lots of people who um, genuinely believe that the astral body leaves and goes to higher planes and, and, and all of that kind of thing. And a lot, a lot of people who are basically idealists, they're not philosophers, so they don't call themselves that, but they, but they would say they, it's consciousness first. Like, um, and then matter came later. Well, as you know, if, if you know, if you're a, a physicalist or a materialist, which I am not, people are always telling me I'm a materialist. I'm not a materialist. <laughs> um, if you're a materialist, you can't understand consciousness, and I don't. <laughs> um, that doesn't make me a materialist. Um, and if you're an idealist, you can't understand matter. I mean, I'm being very crude, but that's because I'm not a real philosopher. So what are, what other possibilities have we got? Now, one thing that is very clear to me both from a logical point of view and from a experiential point of view through meditation and so on is all we have is experience i mean everything i know about the supposed physical world is from books i've read and you know that we have no contact with any physical world other than through experience and like mm -hmm. talking to other people and their experience that they tell us about and so on and so on but does that make consciousness first? I mean, then then how do you deal with the fact that we agree about the physical world um, and that, you know, this chair is holding me up and, and, and so on? So you, you get in a, in a huge muddle and I flounder around in that muddle. But one thought is that is to try to make sense of uh, some kind of non-duality. So, so if you have these, if you reject these two extremes, then you then you uh, you either go to dualism or you have to be some kind of neutral monist, which is where I will put mm. myself in a you know a very uh, hazy hazy position. Uh -huh. What do you do with that? One thing is to say um, 
you could take a panpsychic view of representations that mm -hmm. it's all about representations and when there's something in the world that is representing something else then it's something like it's like to be that because that's what a representation is a representation is describing something so this brain at the moment is is describing in the visual system that tree plant thing that i'm looking at there's something it's like to be that what is it like it's like the representation what it says it's like <laughs> because that you know <laughs> that's the kind of panpsychism that i could go with and think about quite a lot but it it's mm. tricky and waffly and you know doesn't solve all the problems so mm. i think that perhaps answers your question of why you think i'm a bit weird um, mm. <laughs> in 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 countenancing a kind of panpsychism but it's definitely not the kind that would say that every atom has a conscious right. attached to it or something like that because i think that's totally incoherent um and um or, or every stone or every object mm. but i you know all i can say is it's really really hard and i don't have answers <laughs> maybe another thought experiment might help sue so you, you gave us one earlier so let's let's use another one um frank jackson's knowledge argument something that a lot of our guests have discussed in the past you know when mary leaves her black and white room and sees a blue banana does she say aha a blue banana or does she recognize what blue is what do you think very very hard one isn't it it because i i mentioned earlier with respect to the other thought experiment that you have to take it seriously mm. uh what the thought experiment tells you she's in a black and white room she's not colorblind she's in a black and white room mm -hmm. so she's got a functioning visual system it just hasn't ever seen any colors now she knows everything that is to know about color vision well that's pretty tricky, isn't it, There's, to set up a, you know, what does it mean to say she knows everything there is to know about colour vision? You could say if she knows everything there is to know about colour vision, then she will know that somebody who has never seen colours probably has a very poorly developed colour system in their brain. There may be some um, uh, inherited tendency towards colour vision, but, you know, without the stimulus coming in from babyhood, of different colored, different wavelengths, lights coming in and being processed in the the, the, the way they should be, she's not going to have a, a very good color system. So then you could just kind of say, well, she won't really be able to discriminate them anyway. So the, it's a non-question. That's a way of getting out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, the classic answers are, uh, yes, because she knows everything, she'll see, she'll immediately not be fooled, and she'll go, "Ha ha, you're trying to trick me, aren't you?" Or you know, the other answer is, um, "No, she she won't know because she's never seen blue." But I think it's like so many thought experiments. If you really take the the condition seriously, uh, you realise it doesn't quite work. Oh, sorry, Ali, you uh, you fat last one here. Yeah, sorry, yeah, my bad. Um, so last I question for you. Did I? I I thought I must have said something terrible or them. No, 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 not at all. No, no, I was just honestly, I was just thinking about your answer and just completely forgot to look at the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I so, could. I like to like to make. You should have. You should have asked me if I was conscious oh. now, and I would have said, <laughs> "Aha, <laughs> yes." Ah, <laughs> uh, but you've done it yourself, which is. Really, really <laughs> so, so uh, last question. Um, you don't say this explicitly, but it seems as though the issue of free will in the self are deeply tied up if not subsets of consciousness. If you think that consciousness is a delusion, is it also the cause that we're deluded in believing in the free individual self? Yes, absolutely. And you're, you're, you're spot on there. I think those two problems are absolutely intimately um, uh, tied together. I'm having a very long lasting to and fro by email with Dan Dennett at the moment because I so fundamentally disagree with him about free will and about the political implications and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, and I'm one of the things that I keep that, that we're working on at the moment is he, I think, thinks that free will is the same as self-control. And I would say self-control is a real phenomenon. There are people with lots of self-control and people with hardly any self-control and people with strong will uh, and people with weak will. Um, these are all meaningful things and we can measure them, but they depend upon your genes and memes and upbringing and environment and everything else. The person with, with um, good self-control ha has more ability to make sensible choices in various ways, but they're, they're not free. None of, these, none of these actions or choices are free in the way that most people think. And here we have a real problem because we don't clearly know exactly what most people think. But goodness me, I've 
talked to lots of people about free will and done lots of lectures on free will and asked people questions. Um, and there are some evidence about what people think. And my impression is that most people think, as I used to think about free will, that I have free will, that I am the one who decides. So, of course, it's intimately linked up with the nature of self. Now, if the self is um, a soul or a spirit, you know, you can tie free will to that all you like. But if you see the self as as a, a lot of changing structures in the brain that are coming and going for different purposes and expanding and contracting in their, uh, their reach over the rest of the brain and so on, that is also not free in the sense that it's not free of all the processes going on internally and externally. Uh, and so they are both, they're both intimately linked. And why I would call them both illusions is not to say that people are stupid, to, but to say that it's illusory, like when you look at some visual illusion, you can't, you know, it's, it's hard to, mm. to, to see through it. Mm. But they're illusions in the sense that we reify them, we reify the self and give it the power of consciousness and of free will. And mm -hmm. it doesn't have that freedom. Thank you to everybody that sent a listener question in for Susan. We're just going to give three or four really quick ones. Thank you for everyone that submitted them in the past. If you want to submit a listener question for one of our future guests, you can do so on our website. We'll try and fly through four really quickly, Sue. So I'm going to push you for, for quick answers on I each. Really but some of the... quick answers. You're asking me, <laughs> you've asked me some really interesting questions and I've been really thinking on the hoof. And so I'm um, sorry, I've gone on too long. But I, no, I, you, uh, the problem is, is we've written you, uh, hate, we've written you questions more than perhaps for most of the guests because your work is so huge. We could literally spend two hours talking to you about free will having on the back of that question. Um, but unfortunately, we're, we've made a rod for our own back, really. <laughs> well, I will try and answer these few questions the best I can. First question, I think, is from John Defoe from France. I love Susan's work on memes. Thanks for the opportunity for a question. Um, please ask Susan what she thinks about Jordan Peterson's attack on atheism. For context, he told her she wasn't really an atheist because she writes books. It seems like utter nonsense. But Sue didn't really reply to Peterson. Does she still also think he's talking nonsense? Oh, what a complex and difficult man. And terrible things have happened to him now. He's in rehab and oh dear. Yes, that conversation I had with him, which is online, was very, very difficult. I thought from memory that he'd said I wasn't an atheist because I had some sort of moral conscience, which of course is a, a an argument that goes round and round. A lot of um, people arguing forcefully for a religious view will say, you know, if we didn't have religion, where would our moral compass come from? Well, the answer is it comes from our evolved nature. And I did try to argue with him about that. I found him extraordinarily clever and knowledgeable, but he was really abusing the knowledge he had. He would just throw out these, you know, oh, well, the Dawkins and Dennett, they're not, they're not as good as Nietzsche and Goethe, are they? <laughs> Like, I mean, you know, that, that obviously they don't count if they're if they're not as good as that and that sort of thing. But but he he his religious views, you know, his his book is all based on the Bible, and I think he was trying to trying to have it both ways. He wanted he wanted um, he wanted uh, morality to be exclusively for religious people and uh, not for atheists. So I couldn't be one. But I might be remembering it wrong because it, because that John asking that question, it might have been what he said. And I'm sorry, I'll have to go back and watch it again, which I don't particularly <laughs> want to do. <laughs> yeah, and another example of we could ask you follow ups about this for, for quite a while and talk about your views on religion. But we'll jump to a question by Mikael Lontal. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing that from Denmark, who asks, can you detect consciousness in other beings? How would one go about trying? Ah, that's a very good question, because. It makes it it makes the problem so clear. Um, if you believe there is a, such a thing or a process or a power or a function of consciousness, then you jolly well ought to be able to detect it in other people. I don't think that it is like that. I think it's a story we tell ourselves about the way you know about the way our own minds work. We make up this story of of a conscious self. Um, and so I think it, we would never, ever be able to find it. But I differ from all the people who think you can, such as those I talked about looking for the neural correlates of consciousness. They would think, I imagine, or some of them would think, 
that if we could really look in the finest possible mm. detail at what's going on in the brain and if we worked out where consciousness arises or how consciousness arises from objective brain activity and solve the whole problem, then we could have a consciousness meter. Now, I always remember um, many, many, many years ago when we were all young, um, Dave Chalmers <laughs> was a young philosopher just starting out. I was a young psychologist and he came on the stage at the, one of the early Tucson conferences with a hairdryer. And I think it had wrapped around its thing with <laughs> consciousness or something. And anyway, he zoomed it around, you know, pointing at people. He said, this is my consciousness meter. And then very eloquently discussed the problems of whether such a thing could exist or not. Uh, I don't think it will ever be found. And if it is, then I'll be proved wrong. It's always nice to know that there's some way in which you can be proved wrong with your speculations. And uh, our final question here from Katie Vardy in the UK. And I, I, I'm unaware of the context here, Susan. So you might need to explain this for me. Does Susan still believe in aliens? <laughs> still believe in aliens? Uh, well, of course, I do believe that there are planets out there somewhere in, in the universe that have got uh, forms of life that we have not on on our planet i never believed that aliens uh, were visiting us uh, the context may be um, a tv program that i did back in the 90s mm. i presented it was a horizon program called close encounter mm. and i presented it and it was absolutely fantastic i was taken around by the bbc to meet lots and lots of people who'd had alien abduction experiences. And mm -hmm. I met John Mack and, and um, some of the others who have done all the um, hypnotizing of people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. Mm -hmm. And I also um, began to explore the whole phenomenon of sleep paralysis, which I was already doing some research on anyway, and went to... Um, Newfoundland, where they still believe in the old hag. Now, the idea of the old hag was in southern Britain, very common centuries and centuries ago, but died out. Now, sleep paralysis is when you wake up while your brain is still partly in REM, REM sleep, your muscles are still chemically paralyzed, you mm. can't move, but you're awake enough to think, help, I'm awake and I can't move. And you usually have, sometimes have uh, the sexual arousal associated with, with dreaming sleep. And it, it can be very frightening if you don't know what it is. And if you try and breathe, your breathing is under automatic control. So if you try and breathe yourself, you can't. You can't take over the automatic. And so you think you can't breathe. So you think something's squashing your chest. And this is the old hag who sits on you and squashes you. So it was great going and meeting all these people who'd been hag. <laughs> and, all of that. Um, and my conclusion at the end of the program was that um, all these stories were understandable, starting from people who've had sleep paralysis, and then the whole, you know, American phenomenon of, of aliens and, and greys and, and Whitley Strieber's book and all of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and then people being hypnotized and persuaded by false memory techniques and deliberately or not. I think very often not. I think the hypnotists often mm. believe this. So I, I hope that nothing in that program or in the subsequent articles I wrote, and there is on my website a little section on stuff I wrote about aliens. There's a little section called um, Topics, and under there you can you know, choose aliens if you're interested. Mm. I don't think anywhere I said I thought they were really coming. <laughs> uh, around the concluding remarks, you want to kick us off, Mr. Ali Marley? Yeah, well, I just want to start off by saying thank you very much, Sue, for talking to us today about consciousness. Um, I found your book, you know, the very short introduction to consciousness, really brilliant. I think it's very concise. I think you explain the kind of key ideas in this discussion really well. Um, and if people who are not really too aware of this debate start there, I think they that'd be the best place to start in terms of, you know, looking at this topic. And it's been really great just to talk to you. You're a really engaging public speaker. And just to hear you explain these ideas in person has been a real uh, pleasure. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, because sometimes I do these things and they're quite stressful and boring. Well, this is quite stressful because <laughs> it's really hard because you've asked really good questions and you've delved into the things that interest me. But you've also kind of made me think, oh, my God, this doesn't make sense. Ah, But then that's what I like in a way. So thank you. If you don't mind some more flattery, Sue, I want to thank you as well on behalf of all of our listeners for you uh, discussing these ideas with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. And as Ollie says, uh, it's a brilliant book and we highly recommend it uh, to everyone. I came across your work, as I mentioned, first as an undergraduate. And I, I've for, for seen a lot of your talks. I think you're a great presenter of ideas and you've done a great service to public psychology and uh, philosophy indirectly throughout your career. I think your work exploring the nature and 
illusions of consciousness and psychology are really illuminating to the problem. And I think philosophers of mind could benefit greatly by reading some of the case studies that you discuss in your work, particularly your work on things like OBEs and psychological afflictions and those altered states of consciousness that we haven't had a chance to go into. And I, I'll keep this short because I've got a history of going on here. So in short, I think you, you, know, you give us new ways and new perspectives on an incredibly important topic. And uh, so what will it go away and think about? Uh, I'm not sure... I, I, you know, still about the hard problem. I wonder whether you give us a new type of approach to our misunderstandings and analysing the concepts that we so often take for granted in these debates. And I'm grateful uh, to you for that. You mentioned a moment ago that uh, the interview hasn't been boring. I'm grateful for that. But you might think we overstepped the mark here in our final segment. <laughs> Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy quiz. So I've, I've had a history of, of getting these quizzes completely uh, wrong. So I went for a safe one here today. We're going to play Susan Blackmore. So we're going to have quotes from a Susan, a Blackmore, and quotes from Susan Blackmore. And yourself, Sue and Ollie, have to guess who the quote is from. So you're going to have quotes from Susan Elizabeth Perkins, the English comedian broadcaster, uh, best known as one of the hosts of Great British Bake Off. You have quotes from Richie Blackmore, the guitarist and founding member of the English band Deep Purple, best known for their jam-style hard rock, mixing guitar riffs and organ sounds. Uh, bonus question, does anyone know if Richie Blackmore is dead or alive? That's a I think he's still there. alive, maybe? He's still alive, yeah, 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 he's 75. And Susan Blackmore, the British psychologist, writer, lecturer and visiting professor at the University of Plymouth. So you've got to guess, do you get, sorry, Susan, we sprung this on you. You, you were, do you, do you get the gist? We're going to have Susan quotes, Blackmore quotes and Susan Blackmore quotes. I do. And I used to love hearing Sue Perkins on Radio 4. And I often get, uh, when I look up Blackmore things online, I get Richie Blackmore coming up. <laughs> so I have to put Susan. So that's about my knowledge so far. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> Well, that's probably, you might be, a, a, of all the obscure ones we have, you've got, with, with respect, you've got no excuses for not guessing who these quotes are from then. Our first one, the Southwest is like a Christmas stocking. All the nuts end up at the bottom. That'll be Sue Perkins. That's Sue Perkins. It's one to Sue. I'm a good cook, but I can't bake. Oh, that must be Richie, because I, I mean, I, my interest in food is like my interest in football I'm just not interested in food and when I get my my, my great claim to cooking is that I once set fire to spaghetti That's <laughs> quite good, but all you have to do in case you'd like to ever try it is you have to put the spaghetti that's too long for the sauce the boiling water sauce when you put it in and you think uh, you know if I just wait 10 seconds I'll be able to push it in but 10 seconds is long enough for me to get bored of cooking and go off and do something else and then the, the children are shouting there's flames and I'm like oh god I'm cooking <laughs> <laughs> we should say two things right, One, because, of, because of that hopelessness on my part we should say Sue, that a lot of our listeners are a-level students so please don't try that at home <laughs> if, you, if you think that might be something to do uh, second of all that's not yourself that's uh ollie do you want to have a guess who that perkins might be again? that's sue perkins that's one all uh, combing my hair doesn't make me a better musician oh sorry ollie did you get that Richie, one Richie blackmore surely yeah. that's Richie blackmore there's two ones ollie correlation is not a cause me <laughs> That's Susan Blackmore. Nothing matters. It's all empty and meaningless. Me. This is how the world is. That's Susan Blackmore. It's three, two. When you're around someone good, your own standards are raised. Ooh. Sue Perkins? It's not Sue Perkins no. that passes over That's to Sue. Richie. It's not me. That's Richie. That's four, two by my maths. Memories are slippery bastards. Bring them into the light. Handle them too often. They'll bend, change colour. Keep them in the dark and they'll slowly retreat to a place you can't find them. Ooh, Richie? It's not Richie. Ollie Susan Tom, yes. Blackmore, surely? It's no. not Susan Blackmore, oh. so the point goes to Sue there. So that's f it's five or six. We'll give you a final one here. Bob Dylan walked up to me and said, hey, who the hell are you? Richie. That's Richie. Oh, we'll, get, we'll give you one more. We created machines to do our bidding and to make our lives easier and more enjoyable, but we have failed to notice how quickly that relationship is changing. Me. That's Susan Blackmore. Ollie, you've been put to shame there uh, with, I think, a six or seven, two. Uh, so apologies, but uh, you've That's okay. That's worse. fine with me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's too loud, you... that's all. <laughs> 
<laughs> if you enjoyed this episode, please consider picking up a copy of Consciousness, A Very Short Introduction. It's a brilliant book and a link is in the iTunes description. We're also giving away a bunch of copies away on social media. So head over to our Facebook or Twitter page to be in with a chance of winning. Links to all of Susan's other books as well as her website can also be found in the description. A very special thank you to Cullum St. Gabriel's and Western Endowment for giving rise to the subjective experience that is our show, as well as our amazing patrons over at patreon.com forward slash pansycast. Thank you to all of our listeners who have already pledged their support. In particular, a very special thank you to the man at the centre of God's mind, St. David Ligeness. Every car ride feels like a completely unconscious experience, that is, until he steps out onto the Dylan Kirby... In and out of consciousness like a never-ending loop, it's Miss Lily Hooper. He hates coffee, rejects hot chocolate, and is infuriated by any beverage that aren't twinings. Your main man, Mr. T. Rene Descartes, eat your heart out, it's Jimmy Casperson. Forget dualism, your boy's name is made up of several substances, it's Muron van der Kolk. William James has famously said, everyone knows what attention is, but he never met the guy too trendy to pay attention in school. Oh yeah, it's Mr. Adam Cool. And finally, the man who gives us all unconscious muscular action, Mr. Jim Clare. If you're enjoying the show, then please take a moment to go over to our Patreon page and consider pledging a monthly donation. Without your support, it's incredibly hard for me to fund my subscription to Aristotelian Essences for 21st Century Dudes magazine. I think that was for something. <laughs> to all of our patrons, thank you for supporting the show. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, soothing voices of Mr. Ali Marley. Thank you for listening. Dr. Susan Blackmore. Thank you. And me, Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Susan. That was really Yeah, good. it was. It was fun. I'm very embarrassed by the thought of this microphone business at Hay. God, and I was... I, <laughs> I could have been so much ruder.